Welcome back. Our topic is executive control of administrative agencies. Last time our focus was on appointments. Now we turn to removal. The removal power is not simply the flip side of the power to appoint. The prospect of removal serves to concentrate the mind of the appointee. As the Supreme Court put it in Bosher v. Sinar, once in office, as far as the appointee is concerned, it is only the authority that can remove him, and not the authority that appointed him, that he must fear and obey. The Myers case is a leading case on the subject of the President's removal power. The opinion was written by Chief Justice and former President William Howard Taft. As a former President, Justice Taft surprised nobody when he stated an expansive conception of a President's plenary, that is, full and illimitable, power to remove officers of the United States, be they principal or inferior. The Myers opinion finds this plenary removal power to be implicit in the President's Article II duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed. Myers had been removed from his office as postmaster for Portland, Oregon by President Wilson. Myers sued for back pay, asserting that his removal was in violation of this statute, which purports to require the Senate's consent to the removal of a postmaster. The statute seems to make the procedure for removal simply the obverse of the procedure for appointment. As an officer, the Senate's consent to the President's nomination is required under Article II. But the Myers opinion rejected that view. The President's duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed cannot be encumbered by the requirement of senatorial consent to the dismissal of an officer. The moment that the President loses confidence in any member of his official family, he must have the power to remove them without delay. Any member, loss of confidence for any reason, without delay. This is what a plenary power consists of. And does this apply to every official in every office? Justice Taft is careful to qualify. Of course, there may be duties so peculiarly and specifically committed to the discretion of a particular officer as to raise a question whether the president may overrule or revise the officer's interpretation, for example, duties of a quasi-judicial character. Here we distinguish between the power to direct or overrule an official and the power to fire an official. But even in such a case, he may consider the decision as a reason for removing the officer. The opinion states no limit to the kinds of reason for which the president may exercise this plenary power. Presumably, there are First Amendment limits here. Could there also be statutory limits? The Myers opinion seems to leave little room at all for Congress to limit the president's plenary removal power. The President's Article II duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed implies a power to do that, and that implication is reinforced by Article II, Section 3, excuse me, Section 1, which vests the executive power in a President. After Myers, the only role Congress may take in removing an officer of the United States is by impeachment. But impeachment is a cumbersome process that begins in the House and culminates in a trial in the Senate. Moreover, the House may impeach an officer only for certain grounds. Treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Although presidents and judges have from time to time been impeached, only one executive official has been, William Worth Belknap, 30th United States Secretary of War, has the distinction of being the only executive officer 
other than the president ever impeached. Removal of officers of the United States, other than Article III judicial officers, is a task assigned, practically speaking, exclusively to the president as chief executive. Are there no limits to the president's plenary power of removal? The case of Humphrey's executor is among those decisions that tell us that Congress can act to limit presidential power. It was decided, by the way, in the same term as Schechter Poultry, which declared a limit to Congress's power to delegate authority to the president. Humphrey was one of the commissioners on the Federal Trade Commission appointed by President Coolidge and reappointed by President Hoover. Once in office, President Franklin Roosevelt requested Humphrey's resignation. You will, I know, realize that I do not feel that your mind and my mind go along, etc. Humphrey did not take the hint, and FDR fired him. Humphrey sued on the ground that his dismissal was in violation of the FTC Act. A commissioner may be removed by the president for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. The court did not read the FTC Act as idly listing a few of the many reasons for which an FTC commissioner might be removed by the president. The act was read as stating the sole grounds for which a commissioner could be removed by the president. But hadn't FDR complied with the statute? He had not. FDR did not say you were fired for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. FDR exercised his plenary power. He said, you're fired. But under Myers, how could the president's saying, you're fired, fail to be enough? The court and Humphrey's executor did not overrule Myers. Instead, it distinguished Myers in the following way. The narrow point actually decided in Myers was only that the president had power to remove a postmaster of the first class without the advice and consent of the Senate as required by Act of Congress. So, the court continues. The office of a postmaster is so essentially unlike the office now involved that the decision in the Myers case cannot be accepted as controlling. Okay, so the offices are unlike. In what way are they unlike? The court tells us. A postmaster is an executive officer restricted to the performance of executive functions. The FTC is different. The FTC is not an arm or an eye of the executive. Its duties are performed without executive leave and under the statute must be free of executive control. The FTC was intended by Congress to be independent of the president's control. Its duties are not merely executive. It acts in part quasi-legislatively and in part quasi-judicially. Congress meant to delegate quasi-legislative power to an independent agency, and it assured this independence of the president by specifying the only grounds for which the president could remove an FTC commissioner. Mere policy differences would not suffice. In other words, the FTC Act made it illegal for the president to fire an FTC commissioner for disagreements about policy. Humphrey's executor lays the foundation for what are called the independent administrative agencies. To help appreciate its significance, consider the case of a publicly traded corporation like Apple. In the beginning was Steve Jobs. Well, we fast forward a bit, ignoring Steve Wozniak. Apple is incorporated and the board of directors appoints Jobs as chief executive officer or CEO. Apple has a tough time and Jobs brings in John Scully from Pepsi Cola to help out. The board demotes Jobs and appoints Scully as CEO. Jobs departs. Apple struggles. Jobs returns and Scully is fired. Jobs hires great people like Scott Forstall and Johnny Ive and Tim Cook as Chief Operating Officer or COO. Apple thrives. The iPhone is introduced. 
Forstall, in the iOS division, wants scoimorphic design. Icons are made to look like real three-dimensional objects. Ives, in the iPhone division, wants everything to look flat and modernistic. Apple should realize you can't have it both ways. Well, you can, but it looks not so good. Trying to have two design philosophies guiding upon the company. Steve Jobs can resolve the creative tension, but he dies. Tim Cook is promoted to CEO. Creative tension proves to be inefficient. Cook fires Forstall. But what if Cook couldn't fire Forstall? In other words, what if Apple Computer had to deal with its iOS division as if it were the FTC? In the employment law field, under common law, the default rule is employment at will. Under Myers, officers of the United States are effectively employees at will, subject to dismissal at the president's pleasure. But under Humphrey's executor, certain federal officers can only be dismissed for cause. The independent agencies are so-called because they are headed by officials who need not share the president's policy views. Nor need they share the views of executive officials who have overlapping responsibilities. For example, both the DOJ and the FTC have authority to bring antitrust actions. The head of the DOJ, the AG, serves at the president's pleasure. Commissioners of the FTC do not. It's easy to imagine there being some antitrust action that the president can dissuade the DOJ from taking, but which the FTC takes, unworried about consequences and the president's views. The FTC is part of what is called the headless fourth branch. Headless because the independent agencies do not answer to the president, the head of the executive branch. Which are the independent agencies? One clue is whether the acronym ending the, standing for the agency ends in the letter C for commission. TC, FCC, SEC, CPSC, FCFTC, NPC, EOC, etc. Or the letter B. B for board or bureau, as in the NLRB, the Federal Reserve Board, the CFPB, and so on. According to 44 USC, the term independent regulatory agency means the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Energy Regulation Commission, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the Federal Maritime Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, the Mine Enforcement Safety and Health Review Commission, the National Labor Relations Board, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, the Postal Regulatory Commission, the Securities Exchange Commission, the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, the Office of Financial Research, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, and any other similar agency designated by statute as a federal independent agency or commission. Is liberty submerged underneath all this independent bureaucracy? When politicians refer to the swamp, part of what they mean, possibly, is the independent agencies. But if the independent agencies are meant, they form a part of the swamp that the president cannot unilaterally, at his or her pleasure, drain.